we will only be able to face the challenges that we have ahead, whether it be around climate, health, or just all of our sustainable development goals, the 17 of them, which we have since 2015, if we take them as seriously as we took the moon landing, which believe me, was extremely hard. So let's just unpack what that actually means, because this lecture is gonna be about what I call a moonshot oriented approach to changing capitalism. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. By saying we're going to do it because it's hard, not because it's easy, it's actually about admitting the difficulty, the uncertainty, the risk-taking that it's going to entail. Second, he also was very clear it was going to cost a lot of money. He also said not as much as we spend on cigarettes and cigars every year. But that money, he also knew, might actually be partly wasted along the way because there would be failure. He was very explicit about that, that kind of level of experimentation that would be required. And in fact, as we all know, there were a lot of failures. The Apollo 1 program, it failed and three astronauts died on that fatal day in 1967. And one of the astronauts, Gus Grissom, on the day of the Apollo 1 fire, when the three astronauts uh, burned alive. He said, how are we gonna get to the moon? He said, Jesus Christ, how are we gonna get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? Because he couldn't hear, they couldn't hear, what was being said in mission control room. That highlights something that we know today is a huge problem, but we just pretend it's a problem because government is structured in a certain way and it can't change. Government is too bureaucratic. Government works in silos. Government departments don't talk to each other. Well, what they recognized after the Apollo 1 fire was they had to change how NASA was organized. So one of the things they did on the back of that tragedy was bring in this guy called George Mueller from Bell Labs to restructure NASA, to restructure it in such a way that was less siloed, that had more information flows between these two or three buildings, which Gus Grissom complained about. How to make it more agile, flexible, with all the different project managers, with their teams, but constant communication between those managers. Um, which is really interesting, right? In, in, in other words, NASA had to become a creative bureaucracy if it was interested in its goal of getting to the moon and back in one generation. Another really, really interesting thing that happened on the back of, you know, how kind of Kennedy framed this was that, of course, it would require a huge collective effort between lots of different organizations, both public and private. But that wasn't going to happen sort of on its own by simply talking about partnership and the state and business working together. No, it had to be designed into the system. And so there was lots of different sectors. It wasn't just aerospace. There were sectors as different as nutrition, electronics, materials, the whole software industry today, as we know it, in some ways was an outcome of the needs that they had inside the lunar module for constant data processing. Um, and you know, so many spillovers that happen along the way, whether it's the camera phones, the foil blankets, the baby formula, and one of the first things they did when they realized, you know, the difficulty, the uncertainty, the experimentation that was required was to change the contracts between public and private sectors. So procurement, procurement is government as purchaser, not just government as investor. So Ernest Brackett, that was his name, head of procurement, he changed how NASA was doing procurement away from cost plus contracting which he thought wasn't leading and wasn't catalyzing the innovation required. Towards fixed price contracting with built-in incentives for innovation and quality improvement. So think of it like a prize scheme with a fixed price, but then you would get extra if you did really well. 
So just again, that attention to the design of the procurement contract. And they also, within these contracts, were quite bold and confident, I'm thinking of NASA here, of what they should get back because this was a collaboration between both public and private. There was something like 400,000 people involved in the entire uh, Apollo uh, uh, mission from start to finish. So they built in a bold clause of no excess profits. What does that mean? In excess of what you're actually doing, because this is about co-investing, collaboration, collective intelligence. It's not about romanticizing and mythologizing any one actor compared to someone else. Another super interesting thing that happened, the kind of political economy here of the moon landing, was that they also realized early on that NASA, as the lead public entity, had to remain smart, had to, you know, kind of stay with it, even to know who to work with in the private sector. And there was a warning by Ernest Brackett, the same guy who redesigned procurement, because he saw what he thought was a risk of NASA outsourcing too much of its knowledge to others. And he said something which I often quote today. He said, if we continue to not invest in our own brains, we will get captured, he said, by brochuremanship. Now, at the time, they didn't have PowerPoint. So, you know, today I would say captured by PowerPoint presentations by the McKinsey's or Deloitte's who come in and, and work with public enterprise. Um, but he said, we, like the private sector, need to be insourcing capabilities and capacity in order to remain even able to work together, to even know how to write the terms of reference. I just found that fascinating. So just think back what I'm talking about, the kind of need for organizational change, for redesigning tools, the instruments of public policy, like procurement, for getting fair contracting, no excess profits, but also to constantly invest within your organization to remain dynamic, agile, flexible. There's nothing inevitable in this. It has to be done strategically, explicitly, especially if you care to solve really important challenges like getting to the moon and back in a short amount of time. Now, obviously, the social challenges that we have are even harder than going to the moon. They're more wicked. In other words, they require social change, behavioral change, regulatory change, tax change, as well as technological change. However, if we don't apply the same level of seriousness, of explicit strategic thinking to organizational design, to contracting, to intra-organizational capabilities, to admission that this is difficult and not easy and what it means to actually embrace uncertainty and difficulty together.